All right. So I'm already starting a little late. Um, I want to apologize because I can never follow anybody that, that that's that good of a speaker. It's not going to be nearly as entertaining. <laughs> I have to warn you up front. Um, so first time I'm giving this talk, and uh, it's called Cyber, 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 Using the Kill Chain to Actually Accomplish Something. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you have heard of the cyber, the cyber or intrusion kill chain cyber. by Lockheed cyber. Martin? Hi, Dave. All right. Um, how many of you know what all seven steps are? Yeah, right? How many of you actually use it in your day-to-day -day job where you apply it at, at some point? Not very many of you. So a lot of our customers, um, so some of the stuff I do is uh, a lot of defense work with Splunk and our customers. Um, a lot of our customers want to use that cyber kill chain to create monitoring and alerts around those seven steps. And I was tired of just guessing. Um, there's like the MITRE, uh, John was talking earlier about the MITRE framework, which is great to, to kind of break things up into. Um, and there's other people that break threats down into different categories, but I hadn't seen any yet that break it down into all seven uh, kill chain steps. So my idea was I would break down not only what happens for those threats at, at all seven steps, but also what defensive mitigations you can provide at all seven steps, and what alerting and monitoring that you can do as well at, at all seven. And you know, depending on the threat, there's going to be multiple at different steps. Sometimes there's none at all that you can actually prevent. Um, and we'll go over some of that right now. See if I can figure this out. This is actually the, the part of the slide deck that I'm the most happy about because I'm really, really bad with anything design related. And you'll see why. It actually looks fairly decent. Um, so the intrusion kill chain is broken up into seven steps. First step is recon. Um, it's when they do OSINT, right? They're going out there grabbing email addresses from dumps. Um, they're trying to find relationships based on, you know, who's the CEO or who works in marketing, who actually has access to wire transfers. Um, the attacker's going out and trying to find what, uh, what technologies you use. So if you're on your LinkedIn profile and you say, you know, you've implemented F5 and Barracuda filtering or you know you have this DDoS protection or this antivirus you're listing all of those specific technologies on your LinkedIn profile they're also using those to build a full file based on you know your company or you specifically so they can be more targeted attacks. Uh, number two is weaponization See, I made that work. It was all one image. Now it's broken up into seven. Um, so it's the automation of some type, some type of tool. Um, they do, you know, remote access, Trojans, um, anything like that. That that that's the tool that they're building in their basement or or wherever um, that you don't have any view into yet. You know, they're doing that all on their own, just like with the OSINT. You can't really see them doing the OSINT for the most part. Um, so step two also is, is something that's completely out of, out of your hands. Number three is delivery. So that's the, trans, uh, the transmission of the weapon, sending it over email, phishing, that kind of stuff, um, drive-by downloads, USB. There's exploitation, which is step four. That's when the payload's delivered and they're actually exploiting the box. Um, their code triggers, and you know they're actively running something on the inside of your network or outside on, on something that you control. Installation um, allows them to um, maintain persistence in your environment for all that stuff they're going to do later on. Command control, it's when they that thing that they installed is going to talk back to them. It's going to beacon out. It's going to be so they don't have to individually attack one device. Um, it, it's going to be, you know, centralized management for the bad guys. 
And then last step is action and objectives. Um, and that's the end. That's, that's their end goal. They're either stealing your information, selling your information. Uh, so data exfiltration, they're trying to get rid of it. They're going to wipe your boxes. They're going to do whatever they can as whatever their end goal was. Maybe they've set up like a jump box for a botnet or to, um, uh, you know, access other boxes in your network, whatever. Number seven's end goal. So that being said, those are the seven steps. What I wanted to do was break them in, up into common threats, right? So what are, you guys can shout, I like an active, uh, active participation. What are some of the most common threats that you worry about if you're a defender day to day? Ransomware. How does the kill chain affect ransomware? Death. That's what this whole talk's about. We're going to do ransomware. <laughs> so ransomware, um, data exfiltration, um, DDoS, web app attacks, all that kind of stuff that defenders are worried about day to day, I wanted to break up into those seven steps of the kill chain, make it a little bit easier to, to give you actionable steps to take. Right? You're not just saying, okay, I know I need a firewall, I know I need endpoint protection, I know I need this and this and this. You can actually break it down to, okay, we know we're worried about ransomware. Ransomware, is, over the last four years, has gone from, I think it was like the 88th or 89th most popular um, threat to number four over the last three, four years. So it's everywhere. You know, there's a, there's several books out now about how to combat ransomware and about ransomware itself, um, and people are seeing it all over the place. Um, and not just with that kind of stuff. If you, I know people uh, kind of raz on the Verizon DBIR, but they do have a lot of good overall information. They're basically telling us everything we already know. Um, but they broke it down into nine different things that we should be worried about or that people are continuing to be worried about. One of those was ransomware or other crimeware, right? Uh, cyber, cyber espionage is on there, denial of service, um, which is mostly large enterprises. They said 90% is towards large enterprises. Um, things like payment card skimmers, pay, uh, point of sale intrusions, and everything else. Errors, kind of like the one that took down Amazon. So we're going to break it down into malicious action, defensive mitigation, and monitoring alerting. Um, and not only should we worry about defending against each action, we'll also cover a little bit of IR and um, testing and proof of concept as well. So yay, ransomware, what everybody is usually worried about. It gets brought up all the time at work. Um, you know, it's really hard if you don't already have a handle on your defensive infrastructure to prevent uh, ransomware. It's very prevalent in, uh, in companies that don't really have a security program and are kind of just winging it. Um, I've talked to people that have, you know, a dozen, two dozen incidents a year which to me is insane. I know it depends on the amount of endpoints you have, but really that's, that's a lot of ransomware to deal with, especially if you don't have backups, if you don't have any, any idea what was on that box at any point in time. You know, maybe it actually contains sensitive information. Um, and, and a lot of those times they don't have a plan. So reconnaissance. Um, so before, a lot of people think that the first two steps, um, reconnaissance and weaponization, there's not really thing, anything you can do as a defender. I think there is. Um, usually in those first two steps, uh, for a lot of the attacks, it's the same kind of stuff. Most of the time it's phishing, right? You know, phishing always works. They're always going to use it as an attack vector, but there's a lot of things that you can do to not only prevent it, but um, kind of alert on it as well, kind of give you, you know, a step up. You want to use each step as kind of like a funnel, right? So other than, you know, the, the rare case where you have a zero trust network like BeyondCorp, um, 
most everybody is still in the network model where you have a VPN, you have a firewall, you're segmenting, you know, you're supposed to have all of the stuff with segmentation and all that. You're going to want to work from the outside in, right? Because that's, that's where you're going to be attacked at the most and you want to funnel that down so you worry about less as you get closer to the inside of your network. So the malicious action in this case is the attacker obtains your email addresses, technologies used, like we talked about before, all with OSINT, um, and they can build custom phishing campaigns. You know, they know Alice in accounting works with this technology, and you know, maybe she's put on social media that uh, she works in the same office with this, this other person who may, may be out on vacation or something. All that information can be used in that specific um, targeted phishing attack helps it helps them get a little bit further each time um, and there's stuff you can do to prevent that kind of stuff so it's not I don't really I guess consider this defensive mitigation it's more um, like a proactive measure to do some of this stuff but Policies and procedures suck so bad. Um, teaching users that it's not okay to list specific technologies. Um, having your email address out there is going to happen, obviously. Um, but creating policies and procedures around that kind of gives you a, a little bit of more say. You know, when, when somebody's out blasting, you know, on Twitter about what they're doing day to day or taking screenshots of their desktop or whatever, um, it, it gives you something to fall back on um, if something like this would happen. Um, and then for monitoring and alerting, I like this idea. Um, look at the database dumps that are out there. Um, I have I know somebody that has their own elk stack with all of the past like four or five years of database dumps that you can look up like stardelta.com and it'll say oh 500 delta.com employees either had their box account leaked or drop not Dropbox um, Ashley Madison LinkedIn you name it all the the um, the database dumps that have they they're using their their corporate email addresses for this stuff you know they're probably using their corporate passwords for it as well. If you can find that information out there, that's, that's very useful for you. You can make sure those users have a little bit more training, um, that their passwords might change a little bit more often, make sure they're not using the ones that they were using to cheat on their spouse. Um, but that, that's kind of a proactive measure that you can take in that case for step one. Another thing you can do is, uh, say you run your corporate website, put out there uh, like a honey account. So in, in the same background font as whatever your website is, you know, say it's all, all black background font, uh, all, all black background with white font, in black put a account that you're going to monitor that email address for. That's the only place that you put it. And if an attacker is scraping the website and LinkedIn, which you can do in like five seconds with uh, like the harvester or set or whatever. It will go out and scrape all these websites looking for these email addresses. When you get email addresses, uh, emails to that address, you know they will, will have had to scrape that site to get that email address and send you stuff, right? So that's information that you can use as well. So now we're on to delivery. Uh, malicious action, like I said, for the most part, it's always phishing. It's going to be targeted based on the OSINT they use. It could just be a, a mass email as well. Those are pretty common. There's a lot, a lot of defensive uh, steps that you can take for step two. Uh, the first one is block attachment types that are definitely malicious that you probably don't need. Not only block them at the at whatever email gateway is. But you can also, in group policy, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, kind of disable that kind of stuff. Um, so like JS, JSE, WSF, HTA, VB scripts, all that kind of stuff. There's a list of like a dozen or so 
um, file types that you can just completely block at, at the perimeter. Okay, every now and then maybe somebody's trying to send you a legitimate JavaScript file. Probably going to be rare, right? For the most part, those are going to be um, exploits trying to get in with phishing attempt. Um, in, in those rare cases, have them zip it and password protect it. That way they know what exactly they're getting, they know who it's coming from, that kind of stuff. Uh, number two, you can scan on Office documents for macros. Um, use uh, blacklists or gray lists like Spam House, uh, DNS SBL. Uh, a lot of people don't take advantage of the free blacklists and gray lists that are out there to if they handle their own mail filtering. Um, or just move to Google Mail <laughs> because they seem to handle all that stuff really well. Um, proper user education. So if they get that JavaScript file, are they going to report it? A lot of people, you know, also think that user education is worthless. But honestly, if it's done right, um, after you've already put out all of your fires and patched your boxes and you can't RDP in from the internet, um, user education is going to be uh, where they go to next. Because if an attacker can go straight into your network, why even bother with a user who might report you? They're just going to go straight in. Um, but eventually, you do want to have, you know, customized user education for your environment. And that's the kind of stuff that you want to, you know, instill in them is trust but verify. If it's an attachment, they should know that they're expecting an attachment. I'm sure stuff you've all heard before, um, you know, teaching them just to report on stuff is what I always try and uh, talk about, right? Because they're, you know, 100 different pairs of eyes, 100,000 different pairs of eyes, depending on the organization size, that can work just as well as any IDS for stuff that the IDS isn't going to find. If that email gets through and doesn't get flagged on any rule, and it seems weird to them, they should have an easy avenue, avenue to report that to. If they don't feel comfortable talking to you or your help desk, um, they're, they might delete it, sure, or they might click on it just if they're curious. Um, but if they're aware of that's something that's happening, um, you want them to feel comfortable reporting it to you. Um, implement ad blocking on all browsers. Install extensions across the org. Um, that's always helpful for drive-by downloads and stuff. And for monitoring and alerting on that, um, flag screensaver files and JavaScript files over 22 and 15 meg. You should never have those anyways. Um, if you're blocking them, then you don't really have to worry about it. Um, but you can still flag them in Outlook or group policy or whatever to, to kind of or endpoint solution, whatever you're using to alert you if they end up on a box somehow, because they should never be above that, I mean, unless you're a developer or creating screensavers for a living. And then we move on to exploitation, which is step three. <laughs> Everybody's favorite software. Um, this malicious action is when they download a JavaScript file or a word with a macro enabled with some exploit code in it. Um, that's usually what happens in ransomware cases, right? Uh, and for defensive mitigation, not all of this is showing, and it's probably hard to read anyways, but this is group policy for all of you that aren't window admins. Um, <laughs> you can disable all of those file types that I mentioned in group policy. Have them open with Word or Notepad or whatever. They're not going to actually execute a JavaScript file if it's an end user. Um, PowerShell files, whatever. Have it so the default program is Notepad. It's more than likely only going to hurt a couple people. And great thing about group policy is you can restrict it so, hey, admins over here or programs over here can still run that shit on wherever they want and everybody else is going to be, you know, kept from doing it. Uh, endpoint protection, uh, a lot of people also scoff at antivirus. Um, not only do uh, some regulations and standards require you to have antivirus, 
um, it's still going to stop a baseline of just crap that's out there on the internet, right? They have signatures for a reason. They're still doing active stuff um, with, I mean, somebody wants to get in, they're going to get in and bypass antivirus. But for the most part, the automated stuff, it's going to stop. Um, and other endpoint things like carbon black, what have you. And then for monitoring alerting. Um, you can monitor proxy logs for unexpected file retrievals. Um, this is kind of after the fact. I don't know that they have anything in line. Uh, but this is, I think this is part of FLOSS, which will um, deobfuscate common strings from, mal, uh, from ransomware. And you can also block an alert on those. Um, it depends on if you do your own malware reversal, that kind of stuff. You can, you know, have a, have a list of ones that are already known for common ransomware that's out there. And on to step four, which is installation. The malicious action is the payloads executed on the end user's device. Um, keep in mind things like, what is it, Lucky, Server, CryptoWall, and a couple others all use the built-in Windows Crypto API. So that's something that you can keep an eye on that we'll talk about in a second. And that's what's actually encrypting the files. Of course, I mean, if you're worried about ransomware, you have to back up, right? I mean, that's, that's the one major defensive mitigation that you can possibly do for ransomware, is make sure you have, not, not only that you're sure that you're backing up, but you're sure that you can, you're able to restore from those backups. Um, I've been in several places where, yeah, sure, we back up everything, and then they have ransomware, and it's either corrupt or, not accessible or, or, or whatever, but uh, testing your backups is definitely very important. Um, you can use file system firewalls. Uh, Little Flocker is one that um, I recommend that's a pretty good Windows firewall. Um, you can block things on per process basis. Um, there's some experimental endpoint stuff that can actually block ransomware. I've never actually played it with, played with it myself. I have a note down here that um, decryptonite is an example of it. Um, and then number four, have a portion of your IR procedure set aside to what you actually do if ransomware happens. Um, I guess it's not, I don't know that it's really considered a mitigation or not, but if you have a piece of ransomware come in and you don't have a backup, but you know that there's somebody actively, maybe somebody's actively on your network along with that ransomware, you want to know how far you should go in that case um, every time. You know, maybe you categorize your machines. You could say across the board, all end endpoints, sorry, you should have saved your shit up on the cloud. You should have saved it on a file server. Um, if you had something on your desktop, sorry, you're out of luck. That stuff should be not only built into your IR program, it should be also in other policies and procedures that are written. <clears throat> um, let's see here. Oh, and <laughs> if, if you don't have a full IR staff, some people only have one or two people handling their entire security program, you have other stuff to do, right? You can't be sitting there reversing malware trying to figure out where it came from so you can stop it next time. Maybe you have enough money that you can call in a professional and they can do your IR. Maybe you ship out your IR to a third party. Um, you don't want to wait until 5 o'clock on a Friday when you get ransomware and you're like, oh, I'm going home for the day. You can call so-and-so and you don't have any kind of relationship with them. You're now paying, you know, $1,000 an hour or whatever their rate is because they've never heard of you. You don't have a contract in place. Um, that's the kind of relationship that you kind of want to get beforehand, before any of this happens. Uh, then you don't have to worry about, you know, spending way more money than you need to for an emergency case situation. <clears throat> and here's monitoring and alerting for this step. Um, like I said, it uses, a lot of them use the Windows Crypto API. You can monitor for spikes. In encryption, like it shouldn't be, you know, encrypting a million files a minute on a normal user system. 
you can alert on that kind of stuff. Um, and another thing that kind of doesn't really have to do with the defensive that I talked about before, but that you can also monitor on, are outgoing domains. So you're going to want to you know, collect DNS, uh, advanced DNS logging that have an um, inordinate amount of numbers. Most domains don't have you know, a random number string in them. Um, that's usually a sure, sure sign of malware, some kind of ransomware beaconing out um, to like an NX domain or something. And step number six is command and control. And right here the malicious action is it's contacting a CNC server to do the key exchange and for the, de um, for the decryption key to be sent to them. And defensive mitigation for this is um, DNS sinkholes and auto block outbound crap. Right? There's a lot of different sites that will allow you to, um, I, I, most of them, I don't know, I think half of them are probably paid. Um, but there's, uh, I know SANS has a list of stuff that you can use for DNS sinkhole and just outright blocking. This is where you can use, you know, actually use uh, threat intel, right? Block, block all that shit at the firewall. You don't want to alert on it. <laughs> um, yeah, this is, I, I think I took this from SANS. Uh, whole list of known CNC servers that they have that's constant. Uh, this might not be SANS. Malwaredomains.com, maybe? I don't know. I made these like two days ago. So, um, yeah, you can use all of those lists to pull in and just DNS sinkhole them. They go directly to a different DNS server and they're not going outbound. Um, you can also block, not everybody has to get to the internet. You know, you shouldn't be browsing the internet from servers. That kind of stuff shouldn't be allowed through your proxy. Um, there's only a certain amount of people and amount of devices in the, uh, in the infrastructure that should be allowed outbound. And number seven is actions and objectives. So this is the last one. And here's the malicious action for this one. They're pretty much done. Um, they started to delete your volume, sh uh, volume shadow copies if you have those turned on in a Windows environment. Try to delete any other backups that might be connected. Um, and they start encrypting all the stuff on your hard disk. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to recommend, is implement honey directories. So by this point, it sucks. They, it already started to encrypt stuff. Um, your point, you, you know, your, your goal at this point is to stop it from going any further, anybody else clicking on it. Uh, you know, need to focus on whatever the first device was and take your IR from there, whatever your IR procedures are. But a honey directory um, is, say, for example, you create a C colon slash dollar sign dollar sign. There's a, I think it's a, I think it's PowerShell script that will do recursive dollar sign dollar sign directories until the Windows maximum file name uh, length, and that ransomware is going to continually just try and go through each one of those over and over and over and over again, and you can alert on that. Um, it's not, it's already started to, you know, effectively ransomware the system and uh, encrypt stuff, but you might be able to get on top of it depending on how much data is on the, on the computer. Um, a lot of times ransomware will go either by file, uh, file um, size or by name alphabetically. But most of the time, it will hit the dollar signs first. It's the reason why things like your recycle bin gets encrypted before anything else, because it's dollar sign recycle bin. And for monitoring and alerting, um, can you tell where all of the files started to get encrypted? Um, so this is a Splunk graph that's actually looking for, uh, looking over the advanced file auditing files, uh, logs, sorry. Um, 
and you're not going to, the normal user, other, I mean, every now and then they'll like install a program and there'll be a little blip, right? But you're not going to see mass file changes over the system continuously unless something like this is happening or even if it is the random anomaly, um, it's probably something you want to check out anyways. Also, testing and proof of concept, it's something that I struggle with sometimes just because it's hard to sit people down and run through a lot of this. Nobody wants to put ransomware on their network, right? There's other ways that you can mimic it unless you have a full test environment, which I'd love to find people or customers that actually have full test environments that you could do this kind of stuff in. Um, but not everybody's just going to want to stick ransomware on their network so they can test out all of these defenses. But if you have them all broken up into the different levels and you know what it's supposed to look like, you can write a Python script to you know, modify a million files at a time, you know, create, write, read, whatever, modify. And you're going to see the same kind of stuff. You just want to make sure your alerting is working um, and, and the defensive mitigations that you've put into place are actually, you know, make sure that IDS rule actually works how you think it does. Um, don't just blindly put it in place and, and hope that it's going to work when you actually do get ransomware. And I don't expect you to read this. I just kind of wanted to give you an overview of what I plan on all of these to look at at the end. Um, ransomware is the one I have done the most of on so far. Um, next up, I'm going to do data exfiltration, um, privileged misuse, uh, insider threats, whole bunch of other ones, just to kind of put them out there to give people ideas or at least a framework to, to go on. Um, this one I'll put out there now, but the rest of them won't be until October because that's when I actually have to do training on it. Um, and that's probably when I'll finish it. <laughs> and that's me and all my stuff. So a little bit shorter than I wanted it to be, but yay. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or comments or point out that I'm wrong anywhere? <laughs> Go home. Yeah, yep, I'll, I'll go ahead and put these up on my blog. Um, and then as I add more to them, I'll, I'll go ahead and stick them out there. Um, they're just in a Google Doc right now, so, yep. And if you have any ideas of stuff that I can work on as well, no matter what level it goes at, I can just stick it in the spreadsheet or, you know, I'm trying to be almost tool agnostic where I'm not, you know, specifying any specific tools unless that's the only thing that out there that does it, but that's the whole idea. That's it. Thanks, guys.